What is going on everybody and welcome to part 5 of the Deep Learning with Python TensorBoard and Care TensorBoard <laughs> TensorFlow and Keras tutorial series. In this tutorial, yes, we are going to be talking about TensorBoard. Specifically, what we're going to be doing is uh, talking about how we can optimize models with uh, you, you, by using TensorBoard to kind of visualize a bunch of different attempts at models. So with that, let's go ahead and get into it. So looking at this model right here, what are some of the things that you know we might want to test? Because while we did pretty good, like I think we had like a 79% accuracy or something like that, um, that's not, like we should be able to do better than 79, I think. So what the things that we would want to maybe start tweaking, I mean, there's so many, <laughs> um, but we, we could change uh, the, the optimizer, within the optimizer, the learning rate. We could change dense layers, whether we have them or we don't. We could change how many units per layer that we want to have, activation units. We also, we don't need to make these the same. They could be different. We could change the kernel size. We could change stride, which we haven't even touched. Um, and the list goes on and on, like decay, decay rate, uh, that kind of stuff. Well, there's so many things that we could test. Um, and if and as you start multiplying like this many things times this many things times this, like you're looking at thousands of models. So what do you do? So the easiest thing to do, in my opinion, is start with the easiest thing. So the most obvious things that we're going to tweak here are going to be number of layers, nodes per layer, and then basically, you know, do we have a dense layer at the end or not? So, um, so let's go ahead and, and try that. So how, how might we go about doing that? Well, I'm going to comment this out just in case I accidentally run it. <laughs> kill my, kill my GPU again. Um, I'm just going to import time here and I'm just, we're just going to be kind of coding something that I just kind of, just to exemplify and then we'll add it to our script. That, looks ugly anyways uh let's say we're gonna have some choices of dense layers like how many dense layers do we want to have zero one or two then we're gonna have layer layer sizes and then again we're gonna do uh 32 64 64 and 128 why are we doing this so we've seen that 64 units per layer at least is somewhat successful so once you get a model that bites, like a lot of times the first time I train a model, I'm not doing this method. I'm actually just kind of, you know, hunt and pecking for, for anything that will bite. Once I get something that starts to at least learn a little bit where, and, and by learn either, you know, accuracy is going up or loss is going down. Um, once I get that, then I'll go down to the, you know, go down this road for this process. So in this case, you know, you, in theory, you know, you could try a model with 16 nodes per layer, 120, you know, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 10, 24, 20, 48. But the problem is this is going to take forever. So the way that I do it is I'll just do one on each side. So 64 worked. So let's try 32 and then 128. And again, these are just kind of, this is just kind of a convention that people do. You, you, you could do 30, 60, 120 or 25, 50, 100, or whatever you want to do. You don't have to use the, this, you know, bits, basically. Um, but anyway, that's just kind of what everyone does, so everyone does it. Uh, so anyways, uh, just do one thing on each side is my suggestion. So again, one dense layer. We found that zero seemed to be better, uh, but we're going to really confirm that here. One dense layer at least works. So then let's see what happens, maybe two dense layers. That's fairly common as well for people to put, rather than just one dense layer at the end, two dense layers at the end. So uh, we'll do that. And uh, the final thing that we're gonna do is conv layers. How many convolutional layers do we want? Well, we don't want zero. So we want one, we have found that two is successful, and then three. So we'll do one, two, and three. Now, what we're going to do is for, you know, dense layer in dense layers, then for uh, layer size in layer sizes, for conv layer in conv layers. So we're going to iterate through all these. So three times three times three. There's our models. So what do we want to do from this point? Uh, basically, first let's do the more important thing before we forget and make the name. So for the name, we're going to say blank um, conv 
nodes, dents, and then finally we'll do the uh, the time. So this will be com oops dot format conv layer uh, nodes was layer size, and then dents is dense layer. And then finally, int time dot time. Okay, so there is where we begin to iterate through all the models. So let's go ahead and just print um, name. Um, save that. I'm not even gonna run it, run this one in there. So I'm gonna open up console uh, pi dash 3.6 tutorial cats and dogs. And there we have all of our names and model combinations uh, that we're going to go with. Okay, once we've done that, the next thing we're ready to do is actually apply this to our model itself. So, uh, what we want to do is come, let's take, I guess we'll just cut this and then come up here, delete, come down here. Where's our, there it is. Don't want to forget that. And then basically uh, at this point here, we want to do the following, paste. So we grab a new name, uh, just for just to be sure, let me get rid of this name. We should be redefining it, but just in case. Print name. Uh, then we want to tab all this stuff over. Okay, so a few things we're gonna have to take into consideration here. Before, you know, at you know, the first layer needs to have the input shape. So no matter what, we have to throw that in. Then the other thing is uh, bef b the first dense layer that we see has to have a flatten. So we have to consider all those things. So to handle for the conv layers, um, the first one is we just leave this here. Then what we're going to say is for L in range, uh, conv layer minus one, we're going to do this. Ah, oh, shoot, I forget that. I always forget the sublime does that. Anyway, don't forget our colon. So for every conv layer minus one, because we've already got one here, then we're going to do this stuff. Then we're going to do basically the exact same thing for the dense layer. So for L in range of dense layer, this time we don't have to do a minus one. Um, Hold on, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, one, one thing I did was I threw the flat, no matter what, after the conv layers, we're gonna flatten. So what I was doing is, is some redundant flattens, but I actually think, second time going through this, what we could do every time is just throw in a flatten because we know we're either gonna do these dense layers and then the output here, or we're gonna do zero dense layers, but still need to flatten before this one this final dense, like the output layer just is a dense layer, but what I mean by dense layers is before the output layer. So I think this is actually, this is a way better idea. I don't know why I didn't think about this before. So now for L in dense layer, uh, we're just gonna do model.add and we're gonna add a dense layer of size, um, well, it's 64, but in theory, we're gonna use this layer size parameter for the dense layer. That's another thing you probably wouldn't do. Like you would have that those dense layers different sizes than their conv layers. Because the conv layers, that's not even real, it's like features, it's totally different. So you, you, you'd have those be separate. But I'm just trying to show some examples here. So anyways, layer size. And then the activation, we're just gonna use rectified linear again. Great. Uh, and then finally, you've got your last dense layer and you're good to go. Now the only other thing we need to do is fix layer size here and here. And now we've got those, you know, three variable parameters here and we are ready to rumble. So uh, let me do this, kind of clean it up. It looks good, looks good. Let's save it. And I'm at least going to start to run it. Now, this is a lot of models to train. So some people have been like, man, it's taking forever. Well, it's probably because you're on the CPU version of TensorFlow. So if you're interested, um, I'll put, it, well, there's two links in the text-based version of the tutorial. Uh, to the two installation tutorials for, uh, let me pull up here. Uh, so here is installing the CPU and GPU version of TensorFlow on Windows. And then I've also done it on Ubuntu. The process is identical. You're gonna need to 
do a pip install TensorFlow GPU. You're going to need to download and install CUDA Toolkit. And then you're going to need to download and extract CUDNN into the CUDA Toolkit. Um, so that's going to be the same whether you're on Mac, Linux, or uh, Windows. So anyways, um, yeah, but you can check out those tutorials if you want. Also, uh, you can check out Paperspace. That's who I use to put any models in the cloud. They've got a huge assortment of GPUs and varying prices and really arguably the best prices you can get on GPUs still. Uh, so I would definitely check them out. I'll put a link to them in the description as well. It's a referral link. You should get $10 in credit, I believe. Uh, so that should get you started training your first model. But I wouldn't recommend wasting that on this. I'm just going to, I'll show you the results. <laughs> okay. You can also run this on your CPU if you want. But uh, anyways, uh, so I just want to make sure the code works right now. So I'm just going to go ahead and run it and make sure this even works. Name is not defined. Uh, oh, okay, we need to throw the tensor board into here. Let's see. That's exactly why I wanted to remove that name because <laughs> we were redefining it, but that was going to be problematic. Okay, let's try that one now and come back over here. Okay, looks like it's learning, looks like it's training. Good to go. Now, luckily for you guys, I'm not going to sit here and make you guys wait for like, you know, 45 minutes to run through all these models. I'm actually just going to break this. I have already done this. So I am going to close that. And now I'm going to come over. Let's see here. Open up. Uh, tensor, tensor board log dirt equals um, a bunch of logs. Then, um, that'll take a moment to fully load, but soon we will get, oh, an error. Error, uh, I got some funky looking error here. I'm not really sure why I got that, hold on. So this is what I'm attempting, a bunch of logs. Hmm. Well, this is really unfortunate. I wonder if it's because I... I don't know if they hard code the names. Let me delete the old logs. Backend event process. Because, like, maybe it, it, lo it logs the path. I don't think that's how that works. But let me try to just change this name back to logs. Um, logger logs... Oh, no quotes. Don't forget that. I hope that's it. I'm going to be really bummed if I lost all those logs. Oh, it still throws an error, though. But this time it at least loads. That's really curious. Um, I wonder why it's do. Why? I'm just going to accept that key. Oh, it's almost like we've got two different errors going on. Um, anyway, I'm going to... So I think what's happened is in the logs, I guess, maybe in the event file, it saves that it's in path logs or something, because it wasn't finding any of them. This time, it's just got a single key error, but it's not breaking anything. So I want to go ahead and continue on rather than try to debug that one. But just know if you, I guess, if you save a log, or <laughs> remember to rename it back, I guess. I don't know. I, I swear I've done this before. Anyway, here they all are. So we can see them all, and again, um, you know, like this red one here, whatever this model is, it's the one conv, 32 nodes per layer, and one dense. That one seems to not be doing very well, which is curious, um, and it's definitely not because it's just one conv, because we've got one conv and 128 nodes still on the map, so not really sure why why that one was no, no bueno. Anyway, the path that I would take is you know, as I've said before, come to validation loss, go to the end of validation loss, and look at the, the best ones. So, um, by far the best one is 3conv1280. So, 3 convolutional layers, um, 128 nodes per layer, no dense layer. The second best is 3conv3200 dense, again. Uh, and let me... 
wonder if it changes at all if we remove any of the smoothing. It doesn't appear to really change. Okay, anyways, so 3, 32, 0. How about the third best? Wait, what was this one? Threes. Oh, they did move. So now the best one is 3, 64, 0. The second best is 3, 32, 0. And then the third best is 3, 1, 28, 0. So I think we're starting to see a pattern here. Three convolutional layers is the best. Um, zero dense layers, the best. <laughs> so, so immediately we know that now when we go through our model, like, cause, because in, in this case, all the nodes per layer metrics were, um, you know, uh, the best one was, I think it was 64. I forget now. Um, but 32 and 128 were also better than everything else. As long as you only had three, uh, three convolutional layers and zero dense. Now, one thing to keep in mind is it might be the case that the dense layer would be better off being a 512 or a 256, a much larger dense layer, like a 64 layer or a 64 node dense layer is actually quite a small dense layer. So it could be the case that if we were to try a 512, that that would actually beat uh, the, the other sizes. So the next thing you could do is just test that. So you could say, um, all right, we're gonna go with uh, two dense layers. Uh, we'll go with three conv layers. And uh, we'll just do 64 here and come down here. And in my, I think the tensor board only went to 10 epochs if I recall right. Let's check it, yeah, 10 epochs. So let's just keep 10 instead. And uh, in this dense layer, uh, what do we say? Dense layers should be one. I don't know why I said two. There's a three. Okay, dense, the layer size. Let's try, uh, trying to decide between 512 and 256. Let's do 512, just for kicks. So we can save that. Uh, and then, um, let's come up here, pi-36. Uh, we're gonna run, uh, tutorial, cats, dogs. I'm trying to think, do we, uh, hopefully I don't have anything else in memory that's gonna crash. We will find out soon enough. Okay, and we're off. And we did 512 dense. One dense, 512, 64, three conv layers. Okay, hopefully I did that all right. Okay, so the other thing is let's untoggle all the runs. And let's go with 3com320, 3com640, and 3com1280. And then at the very, very bottom, this one right here should be our new model that we're training. So now let me just refresh to get everything on the screen. Okay, so here we can see how things are going. Um, this gray line is the newest one with the 512 dense layer. So really, uh, this otherwise should be compared, I guess, to, uh, is it done yet? No, it's still going. It's done now though. So uh, compare that, let's compare that to the other 64 by three. Well, first let's just uh, hit this, it should be done now. Okay, so yeah, at least in validation accuracy and validation loss, we can see it really just died out here. <laughs> um, but it, it learned in sample better. So. Uh, this tells us a couple of things. One is this larger, uh, you know, dense layer really just helped us to memorize our data, uh, which is no good because we can see the accuracy just went through the roof. Like basically, if I refresh this, it almost looks like we might have gotten a perfect score. At least my notes say 90s or the, you know, the log says 97. So 97 versus the validation accuracy of 82. Um, definitely overfit, especially you can see it happened right here. And you can almost watch it tick down right here. Like you can see where the loss rate almost like hinges right here down. <laughs> so that tells you, so for some reason at that point, the model's like, ah, <laughs> I'll just memorize everything with this giant layer. So um, anyways, that's a lot of stuff that we've kind of gone through, but now the next step would be, okay, now that we know that at least we'll go with zero dense, three convolutional layers and probably we'll go with um, uh, pr one of these. These, these val This validation loss is kind of sketchy on all three. So I, I might, st if it was me, I might actually keep all three of these to go forward, but I'd probably stop changing conv layers and uh, dense layers. I'd probably leave dense at zero. Now, 
what you find here with this confident won't necessarily apply to other um, data sets. So in this case, this is a really easy thing for a model to learn because it's a binary choice. But if you had something like MNIST or something even more complex with like object detection or something, this model is probably actually not big enough to even learn. So you'd want a bigger model. And then the dense layer, adding a dense layer might actually help rather than just help you memorize. So just keep that in mind. No two, you know, even just image operation types of tasks, even if it's a binary choice, no two are the same, uh, especially like the adding this dense layer would actually probably help if we had more samples. Like in this case, I think we got like, uh, what was it, 25,000 or something images, which isn't very much. If we had 500,000 images, probably this dense layer wouldn't be able to memorize things. It wouldn't be large enough of a, of a network to memorize, and instead it would only help. So every time you have a new uh, challenge, you're, probably, you're gonna have to go through this operation over again. But I, I see all the time people are like, how do you know what size ball? You don't, you, it's all trial and error and you tweak things and you basically perform your own optimization algorithm on the models. You make little tiny tweaks in both directions, see where that takes you. And then you keep repeating that process over again. So, and that's why things take so long. Like that's why the Python plays GTA series took forever to progress because you've got to do these like incremental uh, changes. And then when the model itself already takes like a week to train, um, that becomes very challenging. Now, obviously some things are very important, like rectified linear is pretty good, but if you've got, um, you know, like understanding what kind of output uh, or what kind of activation layers to use? Like, do you have negative data? Um, the other thing is like, uh, you know, you always want to scale your data. Uh, you want to take those things into in, into consideration, and it, it can help to some degree to understand like how do activation functions work, so you can understand maybe that you should use a different one in certain circumstances or something like that. But for the most part, this is how you do it. And in fact, this method here, uh, this has been what I've been using for quite a while. Uh, but recently I was looking at like a, 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 a talk from somebody from TensorFlow and they did the exact same thing, <laughs> the exact same thing. I figured somebody from uh, Google would probably have a better method than this, but no. So <laughs> uh, this is what even the pros are doing. So anyways, uh, that's all for now. If I've uh, glossed over something, if you've got questions, comments, concerns, whatever, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, I will see you guys in the next tutorial. I don't really know what the next one will be. I, I still would like to cover recurrent nets in this little series. Um, and there's like a few other things I wouldn't mind covering. And I, I can't really decide if I want to do more like t this kind of stuff where it's like the kind of the APIs helping you understand your model. So things like check, you know, automated checkpoints and stuff like that, or go into recurrent nets and stuff like that. Also, I've seen some questions about like uh, AMD GPUs. No, you can't do that. With PyTorch, also I've seen lots of requests for PyTorch. I see you guys. I'm aware of PyTorch's existence. Let me tell you what I think of PyTorch. So let's just go to Google. I'm gonna type PyTorch examples. I'm gonna click on their GitHub for PyTorch examples. And uh, pull this over here. And let's go to MNIST because we've seen an MNIST data set. Let's go to main. All right, here we are on an official example. Okay, clearly this is like your model. I get it. All right. So you've got one conv layer, two conv layers. You've got a dropout. That's the other thing we didn't even talk about. Um, but you, you would start to add dropout. Like, and again, dropout will will help you against overfitment. So if we added like a 20, 30% dropout, especially at the end of this dense layer, that would help the model to not overfit. Um, and that might actually give us even better accuracy. So that'd be something worthy of checking. Um, let's see, model.add, let me just add it real quick. I don't know if we've, uh, droop out, <laughs> add dropout. I think I can do this. I think that's, that's the right syntax. We'll find out soon enough. Let me just run that real quick as I go back and complain about PyTorch. Um, okay. Uh, so anyways, uh, there's your, your model. And then you've got like, you know, the, I guess as it goes forward, now you've got your, your activation functions come in at this stage. Okay. Uh, then here's your training uh, where you're going to, it's kind of like, you know, the thing, it's kind of like your compile. So what optimizer are we gonna use? And also this is, I guess, where you pass in data and target, and then here's how you test the things. 
Um, and then this, I can't really fault it because it's, it's just a command line or, you know, interface. Um, but look at this code. This is ugly. This reminds me of, like, everyone's like, oh, it's more Pythonic. This reminds me of, like, base raw TensorFlow. Um, so if anybody knows a, you know, an API that sits on top of PyTorch, I'd, I'd love to look into it. Um, but I have no interest in going back to the raw, you know, coding the, the models in a much lower level manner. Uh, it just involves too much room for error. Uh, and I just don't see the argument for PyTorch. I just don't get it. So if you're one of these PyTorch people, uh, tell me why PyTorch. <laughs> I just don't get it. I just don't, I don't want to write this code anymore. <laughs> I'm really enjoying Keras. Um, and I, I feel like I did my time writing raw TensorFlow. Um, okay, so our model is done. Uh, and let's go to HPC. I don't know what I did with the other tensor board. It does not look like it did any better, but we'll see. Um, and in fact, let's just untoggle all of them. So this should be the latest one. And then let's just do like 3320. So validation accuracy was actually better until right at the very end. Um, and the validation loss looks pretty good too. Let's, let's pop up the other three and then where's three, one twenty eight. Okay, cool. So, uh, the orange one validation accuracy loss. So it, it did pretty good. Um, it's pretty comparable, uh, with the dropout. Uh, but still, I, I think it probably, you would just want more data anyways. That's enough for now. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints. You don't like what I just said about PyTorch. Uh, leave it below. <laughs> Otherwise, I will see you guys in another video. Also, let me know what you want to see. Do you want to see more of like the API type stuff uh, like TensorBoard? Do you want to see more information on TensorBoard? Because um, there's all kinds of visualizations that we can actually do in TensorBoard, which is kind of cool. Um, or do you want to see more like models and things being applied to things and all that? So anyways, let me know down below. Otherwise, I will see you guys in another, hopefully much shorter video.